Thank you, Greg, for that. I appreciate that introduction very much, and good afternoon. Uh, it is certainly uh, good to be with you. I feel honored and blessed to have been asked to be a part of this lectureship. And this is my first time uh, in Oregon. I have, have uh, never visited here before, flown through a time or two in uh, uh, north and south of you, but not uh, have never been here, and uh, I have to say it's, it's beautiful. And uh, uh, this is uh, certainly a, a great day and weekend for me. Certainly glad to be here. I'm good to, it's been good to get reacquainted with Greg and LaDon and appreciate so much. He mentioned how we met. Another connection we have is that um, many years ago, I also did some work in Albania. And so uh, there, it's, it, it amazes me sometimes when you start comparing notes with members of the church around wherever you are in the world, there's a connection somewhere. And even if there's only the connection of the blood of Jesus Christ, that's enough, isn't it? You know, one of the things that uh, I have been so blessed to do in my work is travel to so many different places in the world. And one of the things that, that I got in the habit many years ago of doing was just acknowledging that to my brethren, uh, wherever I preached around the world, that we are part of one family. And uh, it's a great family. In fact, I would say it is the greatest family on earth. And we share that even though, um, as Greg mentioned, when I'm traveling in Latin America, I, I, can, I do speak Spanish, and so I can communicate uh, better that way. But a lot of the places that I go, I just came back in July from Cambodia. I uh, didn't understand a single word. Uh, if you were to quiz me now, I could not give you one single word of Kamai um, that, uh, uh, that would mean anything. I did not learn anything like about that. But still, we have the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's enough, isn't it? And I usually tell, uh, certainly my students, but sometimes the brethren when I'm preaching, uh, I would tell them, and I, I look forward to that day when all of us, the entire family, are going to be gathered together before the throne of God and we'll all be speaking the same language. English. Now sometimes they laugh, sometimes they don't laugh, but um, you know, sometimes I get rather stern looks from some, but, uh, but we will. Whatever that language is going to be, we're all going to understand it. You know, several years ago, in a Bible class that I was teaching, toward the end of that class, the, a, a little bit of a side discussion started. A question was asked about inspiration. And we didn't have time to deal with it fully in that class period, but it, it started me thinking and working on what would become this lesson that I'm going to deliver today. And I will acknowledge that some of this may sound a bit repetitive from, uh, from Brother Cliff's le first lesson last night, because we're talking about the same thing. The inspiration of God's Word. We're going to dig a little deeper in some areas, but, uh, but it'll be good for us to, to have that repetition. You know, too often... I think we take, we take for granted in the church some of the things that we're going to talk about uh, in, in this lesson. Um, we really all, and Cliff said this last night, and I agree with it, we really do need to learn to defend the truth. You know, a lot of our teaching has to do with us being able to defend the truth that sets men free, John 8 and verse 32. But we need to learn to defend the Bible itself. Uh, as, a, as a, a collection, uh, of, as a unit, as the source of that truth, it's, and even to defend its very existence. And in, in this lesson, we're going to examine uh, more of those evidences of inspiration. We're going to examine some external evidence of inspiration. By external, we mean from sources outside of what the Bible itself says. That's internal evidence. But we can't ignore what the Bible says, and we will look at some of that as well. Some of what the Bible itself said, you've already heard. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration, or some versions say, is inspired of God. And Cliff pointed out that that word inspired means breathed of God. God breathed. They're His words, and profitable for teaching, for correction, for, uh, uh, for reproof, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. It has all that we need, but it claims to be from God. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 also was mentioned about how men of old, moved by the Holy Spirit, wrote the things that they wrote in prophecy. And so this lesson 
In this lesson, we're going to note that the Bible is the inspired Word of God because of the evidence. And the evidence that we're going to look at in this particular lesson is this. The claims of the Bible itself prove that it is inspired. The historicity, and I'll explain what we mean by that, the historicity of the Bible proves that it is inspired. The unity of the Bible proves that it is inspired. And then finally, the prophecy of the Bible proves that it is inspired. Let's look first at some of these claims of the Bible itself. And, and I want you to, before we look at some of the passages, I want you to consider a point of logic. Now, as you might gather, in a lesson like this, in a place like this, we're going to, we're going to approach this lesson from the point of view that the Bible is indeed the, the inspired Word of God, and the Bible itself claims that. But consider this point. If the Bible did not claim that it is the inspired Word of God, would we bother with such an argument? Or even such a lesson? We don't bother to have a, a similar discussion about ancient or modern great or not so great works of man. We don't, we don't enter into a discussion about that. You may have a favorite uh, author from ancient times or more modern times of, of uh, things that you... But you don't stop and think, I wonder if that came from God. Never even enters your mind. We don't bother uh, with those kinds of arguments. But, this, but since the claim is made by the Bible, then that claim is at least worthy of consideration, isn't it? Now, we don't have time in uh, even the whole weekend to adequately examine all of the different places in the Bible itself that tell us it is God's Word. In the prophetic books alone, for example, the phrase thus, uh, using the old King James terminology, thus saith the Lord, occurs more than 3,000 times. Just that phrase, just in the prophetic books. When you add to that, how many times you read, and God said, or hear the word of the Lord, then we're just overwhelmed with the frequency with which the Bible claims to be the word of God. But consider just about three examples. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 9. Jeremiah there says, Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So the words that Jeremiah preached were God's words. Matthew twenty-two thirty-one. 31. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? And then he repeats that. That's God's word according to what Jesus said. Acts chapter 1 and verse 16. Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David. So there you have God, the Holy Spirit, putting words in the mouth of the prophet David concerning Judas, who would become a guide to those who arrested Jesus. So throughout, you've got an Old Testament passage, you have a passage in the New Testament in the Gospel accounts, and then as we move on into the history of the church, the Bible claiming to be, and this is just a sampling of what the Bible claims to be, the inspired Word of God. Now, as was pointed out, that by itself doesn't solve the, the problem, does it? Doesn't fully answer the question, but guess what? We're not finished answering the question. Let's look at the historicity of the Bible. The historical accuracy of the Bible might be another way to say that. And, and we might first consider the testimony of archaeology and how the Bible stacks up with archaeology. Time and again, archaeology has proven and confirmed biblical claims as fact. Even when up until the time of, a, of an archaeological discovery, archaeologists themselves said, this contradicts the Bible. And then a, discussion, or a discovery is made. The, when I was a student at Bear Valley, all those years ago, our instructor for the course in Christian Evidences was Brother Warren Wilcox. And uh, Brother Wilcox told us a few times in class, when he would, we would talk about some of these archaeological discoveries, 
He said, it's almost like God was thinking this way. I can't speak for God, but it's almost as though God waited until the scientific community was so convinced that the Bible was wrong, that they knew the Bible was wrong. They knew they had the evidence to prove the Bible was wrong, and, and God said, okay then, deal with that. As though it was, they might find it humorous. Well, he wouldn't find it humorous. Souls are being lost. Souls are at stake in all of this. But archaeology consistently proves that the Bible is right. Time and again, uh, archaeology has proven and confirmed biblical claims as fact. From the patriarchs to Israel in Egypt, to the conquest of Canaan, to the kingdom under Solomon, to the de deportations of Israel and Judah, to Assyria and Babylon, <coughs> respectively. The Bible is consistently proved as correct. It's also proven scriptural details about the life and the times of, that, in which Jesus lived. I was uh, blessed to be a part of the Bear Valley, uh, Bear Valley Bible Land Studies, Bible Land Studies Tour back in March. Uh, most of the faculty, quite a few students and, and graduates and friends of Bear Valley, about 40 of us traveled to Israel and spent two weeks there and, and got to see things that just literally changed my my uh, way of thinking from now till, till I die. Um, being able to visualize some of those things. That we can, archaeology shows us what this was like, what that was like when Jesus lived uh, and, and uh, did his ministry in this world. Let's look at some passages. In the book of Job, the book of Job was written about somewhere around the year 2000 B.C. It may very well be the oldest book of the Bible. I know it's not found at the beginning, but uh, <coughs> it appears to have been written somewhere around the time of, of Abraham. Job being maybe a contemporary of Abraham. Well, that far back, look at some of the things that the book of Job tells us. In Job chapter 26 and verse 7, the earth we read hangs on nothing. The earth hangs on nothing. Well, before Almost everybody, before the year 1543, A.D. 1543, just a few hundred years ago, believed that the earth was mechanically supported and all of the movement was in the heavens. In fact, um, I remember in, a, in one of my classes at Bear Valley, another uh, professor talked about when the first Russian cosmonauts went into space. And, uh, of course, at that time, Russia was a communist nation, very atheistic in, in everything that they did. And the Russian com cosmonauts, following the party line, flew up into outer space, and they sent back a report, said, we have come up into the heavens, and we've looked around for God, and what we find is nothing. And what my professor said was, they didn't realize it, but what they were talking about was God's suspension system. Because God's Word says that the earth is hung on what? Nothing. Then that's what they saw. They didn't understand any of what they were seeing. But it wasn't until 1687 that Isaac Newton formed his theory that gravity held the earth in orbit and a lot of other things in place. Also in the book of Job, Job chapter 36, verses 27 and 28, uh, Cliff mentioned the water cycle. That is mentioned there in the book of Job. Aristotle, in about the 4th century B.C., 1,650 years later than Job, talked about the water cycle and finally understood it. Job 38, verses 25 and 26, lightning causes rain. I, 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 meteorology is, is a fascination to me, um, and, and so th this was a particularly of particular interest to me. But cameras in 1930 first showed that there are leaders from the cloud cloud to the ground that lightning follows. Now, all of that happens much too quickly for us to be able to see with the naked eye. But 1930, that's almost. 4,000 years after the Bible said. It's over 3,000 years later. 
the Bible talked about that. It wasn't until 1960 that we understood that drops of water made up of droplets of water. The clouds have droplets of water and lightning ionizes those droplets together so that they come together and form drops heavy enough to fall to the earth. And then in the summer 1964-65, then it was understood that the electrical charge is what does that. And yet, that was written into Job so many years ago, millennia before we understood that. Well, let's come to the book of Genesis, written about 1400 B.C. In Genesis 1 and verse 9, the seas lay in one bed. In one bed. Well, in, in uh, the early 1500s, as explorers from Spain and Portugal and, and England and, and the Netherlands <coughs> began to sail the, the ocean blue, they learned and told everybody else that, that there's water all the way around the world. The seas lay in one place. And yet Moses wrote that at the very beginning of the Bible. In 1960, it was learned that the foundations of the sea have never seen dry land. Genesis 7, verses 19 and 20, tell us about the flood in Noah's time and tell us that the, the, the entire earth was covered in water. Well, before A.D. 1800, there were a lot of stories of the flood, a universal flood or a huge flood, but they were never really given any scientific background. And yet, at that time, in the 1800s, Edward Seuss was the first to discover that all land has been underwater. Genesis 15 and verse 5. The stars are uncountable. Hipparchus said in 150 B.C. <clears throat> that there are certainly less than 3,000 stars. About 200 years later or so, Ptolemy counted 1,056. Now, I, have, I don't know if you've ever tried to do anything like that, but if I start trying to count stars, I'm going to get to about 12 and say, wait, did I count that one over? I'm going to have to start over. I don't know, how do you, how do you count 1,056 stars? But he knew that that's probably not all of them, but there could not be any more than 3,000. <clears> well, we've discovered since then, of course, Galileo's scope in 1608 discovered that they are, there are many, many, many more stars than previously thought. And we know now the Bible was right. Psalm 8 and verse 8 was one that was mentioned last night. Uh, the ocean, the paths of the seas. <coughs> Excuse me. And Matthew Mowry discovered that reading his Bible, as I understand, in his sickbed. Reading his Bible, read Psalm 8 and verse 8, and then went out, when he recovered, went out and discovered the currents of the oceans. And I believe, I think I'm correct in saying this, that at the Naval Academy, uh, the United States Naval Academy, there is a statue of Matthew Mowry, and in his hand he is holding a Bible. Well, that by itself doesn't prove the Bible is inspired, does it? But it does say something about the evidence that, that is beginning to stack up. Proverbs 8 and verse 27, the circle of the earth and the circle of the deep is mentioned. That's the, uh, Proverbs is written about 9, uh, 1000 to 950 B.C. And that's also mentioned, those, that same terminology in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22, written in around 722 B.C. Well, until Aristotle in the 4th century B.C., the earth by many was considered to be flat. I'm not convinced that everybody believed that it was flat. If you lived on the coast and you watched a ship sail until it was out of sight, you would notice that it was sinking, wouldn't you? Now, the first time you saw that, you might think, thank you. You might think that, uh-oh, that ship is sinking. But then it comes back, and it comes back rising up. I would not be surprised to find out that there were people living on the coast who did not believe the earth was flat at all. But that's, that's generally the line that we have. The Romans believed that uh, the, the earth was a flat disk in a circular shape uh, anyway. It was still considered flat by some when these explorers I talked about in the early 1500s began sailing the ocean blue. Many people were still afraid of, of finding that they were going to sail off the edge. 
You may not realize this, but there are people today, some even in the church, who have made this a doctrinal point, who still believe the earth is flat. And yet the Bible, so many centuries and even millennia ago, said it talked of the circle of the earth. And that word circle, by the way, is a word that means more a globe or a hemisphere, a spherical shape, not just a flat disk in circular shape. Jeremiah 31, verses, 30, uh, verses 36 and following. The heavens cannot be measured. I have a bad habit of taking the water somebody gives me and then not drinking it. I try to remember to do that. <coughs> Written about 600 B.C., the heavens cannot be measured. Before, again, before 1800, the universe was considered to be static. That it's, there's so much as the universe and then it stops somewhere. The most distant star was considered to be 3,260 light years away in the, from the period of 1835 to about 1901. Even Albert Einstein said in 1917 that the universe is finite and static. I don't know if it was in a box shape or not, but it was in a circle, I don't know. But that it's finite and it is, that it is static. However, the Mount Pal Palomar, Palomar Observatory which you're probably familiar with in this part of the world, showed that there are trillions of galaxies and they are all moving away. And yet scripture said 2,600 years ago that the heavens cannot be measured. So what is the value of archaeology? Archaeology by itself does not prove the authority or the inspiration of the Bible. It only confirms the Bible's accuracy, but that by itself is proof, is evidence that we add to our collection. So now, consider the proof of the unity of the Bible. Cliff mentioned this, that it really is all about one message, isn't it? It doesn't contradict itself. It has one basic theme. The Bible opens with the story of how man came to need salvation. He said book of Romans tells us that because man sinned, death entered the world, death stayed because we all sinned. And then the rest of the Old Testament basically tells the story of how God prepared a way, a family, through which the, the Savior would be born. The Gospels tell the story of the birth, the life, the death, burial, and resurrection of that Savior. And then the rest of the New Testament tells us basically how we can find that salvation through that Savior. It's all one message. And so we must use the whole Bible. You know, there, there are certain passages that give us a fairly well complete treatise, a treatise on a given subject. For example, 1 Corinthians 13 is a fairly complete treatise on the subject of love. <coughs> there are other passages of Scripture that talk about love, certainly. But that's a pretty good treatise on love. Hebrews 11 is a fairly complete treatise on the subject of faith. Proverbs chapters 8 and 9 give us a fairly good treatise on the subject of wisdom. But you know, there's not a passage that we can point to that gives us a complete treatise on salvation. One passage. There's not one. So how are we going to know anything about salvation? We're going to have to look at what all of Scripture has to say about salvation if we want to know that. For example, Luke 13 and verse 3 tells us that if we do not repent, we cannot be saved. Without repentance, we'll be lost. So that tells us repentance is necessary, doesn't it? But it doesn't say anything about confession. In Matthew 10, verses 34 and 35 we read that if we don't confess Jesus, He won't confess us before the Father. And so confession is necessary, but that doesn't say anything about repentance, does it? In John chapter 1 and verse 12, we're told that we must receive Jesus to have any hope of becoming a child of God, but it doesn't tell us anything about how to receive Jesus. And so the point is we have to look at all of what Scripture says about salvation in order to, be, uh, to know what the biblical teaching is on salvation. I heard a fellow say one time uh, from a denomination, he quoted Romans 10 and verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And then he said, everything I need to know about what to do to be saved is found in that verse. And, and I've heard others say it. And my response to that always is now, so then you don't believe repentance is necessary to be saved. You don't have to repent. Oh, yes, I believe. Well, that verse doesn't say anything about that. See, we need everything. We need to read, study everything the Bible has to say about uh, salvation in order to, uh, to, to know that. And let's not forget about the unity of origin. Just very briefly, 40 men over a period of about 2,000 years. It's not. And so that unity gives a strong proof that the Bible is inspired. But another proof that does that is the prophecy of the Bible. Now, consider the value of fulfilled prophecy. Repeated and accurate predictions of future events must be supernaturally given. Now, anybody can guess right from time to time, but repeated and accurate predictions of future events must be supernaturally given. And the Bible prophecies have repeated and accurate predictions of future events, therefore the Bible prophecies must be supernaturally given. And let me give you a contrast just so we know what we're talking about. Some of you may remember a few decades ago, uh, Jean Dixon was a modern day, uh, I guess, prophetess. Uh, you would most likely see her prophets, prophecies on headlines at the grocery store as you're checking out, you know, on, the, on the, uh, those kinds of newspapers like the Inquirer and things like this. Her accuracy rate over the years was about 26%. I want to read a passage to you. Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 through 22. <coughs> but the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. All right, that's just a basic statement of law. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. And so the law said, the law of Moses, if a prophet prophesies in the name of the Lord, or says he does, but that thing doesn't come true, kill him. Now, two saving graces for Jean Dixon. She didn't live, we don't live, under the law of Moses. And... As far as I know, she never claimed to be prophesying in the name of the Lord. But there's a difference there, isn't there, in prophecy. The value of fulfilled prophecy. God himself said, if it's from me, if it's from my word, it will come true. And it always did. For time's sake, I won't look at all of the examples uh, in detail, but Isaiah chapter 11 Verses 11 and 12. Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, Judah was restored back to the land of Palestine. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the establishment of the church. And his people were gathered from all of these nations. Very quickly, Ezekiel chapter 26, the destruction of ancient Tyre, the ancient city of Tyre on the Mediterranean coast. There were seven events prophesied, and all of them were fulfilled. In, uh, this is in Ezekiel 26. Uh, verse 7 says Nebuchadnezzar would take the city. He did. Verse 3 says, other nations would participate. They did. Stones and timbers would be thrown into the sea. In verse 12, that happened. The city would be made flat as the top of a rock. Verse 4, that happened. Other cities would fear. Verse 16, that happened. It would be a place to spread nets. Verse 5, that also was fulfilled. And old Tyre would never be rebuilt. Verse 14, it never was. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel prophesied that a kingdom would be set up during the reign of four worldwide kingdoms. And he identified those kingdoms. And they were Babylon, 
Then the next one would be Medo-Persia, the Medes and the Persians. The next one, the third one, was the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. And the next great empire that came on the scene was Rome. And Daniel said, in the days of those kings, the eternal kingdom would be set up. And guess what power was ruling the world, at least the known world at that time, when the church was established? And that was Rome. Prophecy fulfilled. These are not just prophecies that are lumped together with casual reading that, that takes place while waiting to check out at the grocery store. These prophecies, and many more, are historical fact. The only prophecies in the Bible that have not come true are prophecies that have to do with the Day of Judgment that are still in our future. We have absolutely no reason to think that even though all of these other prophecies were made and came true, that those that are still in our future will not come true. In fact, there's a uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3, in the first five verses, <coughs> the Apostle Peter makes a point that there are marker, mockers in the world. And you know what? They're still around, aren't they? In fact, they seem to be louder uh, and more obnoxious than they used to be. They're still here. And one of the things that the mockers say is that, that uh, you know, where is this, uh, this whole idea of judgment coming from? Because everything continues just as it always has since creation. In other words, they're saying, there's not going to be an end to this. I don't know that any of those specific individuals that Peter was talking about was denying the existence of God, but it all fits into the same category. And Peter writes, so when they say this, I think this is around verse uh, 5, three, three, or 3 through 5. When they say this, the New American Standard Version uses this terminology, it escapes their notice. That's not really a good translation. The literal translation is, they are willingly ignorant. In other words, they not only know the truth, they don't want to know the truth. They ignore the evidence that God created the world out of water and He destroyed it with water. And guess what? He saves some of us with water. It escapes their notice. And He ends that chapter in, in 2 Peter chapter 3 by saying, don't you, if you'll allow me to paraphrase, don't you be carried away by the error of unprincipled men. That's in verse 17. He had said in verse 11, that knowing all of this, what manner of men should we be? Don't you be carried away by the error of unprincipled men. And then verse 18, but, this is what you do, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Given all of the evidence of the inspiration of the Bible, the extra biblical material, the archaeological evidence that we see, the, the uh, interior evidence that we see in the Bible, what it says about itself, and all of this, given all of that, what manner of men should we be? And our uh, encouragement is to each of us grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Charles Wesley said, the Bible must be the invention either of good men or angels, bad men or devils, or God. Now reason through that. It could not be the invention of good men or angels because they neither would nor could make a book and tell lies all the time that they were writing it, saying, thus saith the Lord. Not if they're good men or angels, when it was their own invention. It could not be <clears throat> the invention of bad men or demons, because they would never write a book which commands all duty to God, forbids all sin, and condemns their souls to hell for eternity. Now, <laughs> what kind of logic would suggest that? The only conclusion we have left is that the Bible is what it says it is. It is the Word of God. Friends, it's not a sin to ask questions. I think sometimes people think that it is. 
Maybe I don't have enough faith because I'm having doubts or I have questions. It's not a sin to ask questions. It's not wrong to ask questions about the origin of the Bible. Our faith is not completely blind. We may, however, rest assured that our questions and our search will be amply rewarded with evidence galore that the Bible is exactly what it says that it is. Now the question remains for us, what are we going to do with that? What are we going to do with that conclusion to a logical argument? I pray we, we will do the right thing with that. Will you join me in prayer? Father, I do pray that you will help us to understand that the, the Bible is your word, that it is what you have said to us, what you expect of us, and I pray that you will help us to do it. I pray that you will uh, be uh, with and bless this congregation in this place, that they may reach out into this community and find those souls that are searching for this truth that we know we possess. Help us to share that truth in such a way that your kingdom grows throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I guess we will break till the top of the hour again.